Hi there, this is Self Critical Automaton, and welcome to the next episode, which is. Oh wow, yeah, no, I, I forgot how ridiculous her spine is. Anyway, welcome to the next episode, which is going to be episode 11, I think. I have kind of committed to not looking it up at this point. Uh, for the second half of chapter 5. So, we're picking up where we left off, as you can see, by immediately triggering this fight. So this is yet another variant on the basic the basic guys, the ordinary guys, the standard bog standard angels that we've been fighting the entire time. So these ones are bigger and there's more of them. No, there's not. They're bigger and they have swords and shields instead of whatever other bullshit weapons they've had previously. So for once it doesn't immediately start you in with um, needing to dodge something, these guys just stand in front of you. Occasionally they go into a quick attack, but that's just part of their standard moveset. It's not actually hard programmed in that they will immediately launch into an attack the second the cutscene is finished and you have to dodge it. Also worth noticing, there is a different... Uh, can I? There we go. Also worth noticing, there are you know different torture attacks for different positionings. So these guys have one for if they are... Uh, standing on the ground flat, one if they're in midair, and one if they are lying down after having been knocked over. Oh no, I did it again. Ugh. I needed, uh, I needed that magic gauge full for the next... F uh, oh well. It's kind of infuriating, but what can you do? Um, what was I talking about? I don't remember. Yep, nice, easy, perfect platinum. They're not that difficult to fight, provided you are, you know, on with your dodge timings. So... Once again, this is an interesting traversal power, and I think it could make for a really fun mechanic, except for the fact that it's very gated, and you can only use the Witch Walk to walk up the walls on um, very specific occasions, only when you are explicitly allowed to. Which I think is bad design. I generally think players should be given access to all of their tools at all times, and, you know, made welcome to use them whenever they please, because, honestly, that's just more fun. If it leads to, if it leads to glitches and problems, that's okay. This sword's so slow. Okay, right. So yeah, I hate these things. They're a huge pain in the ass to fight. And uh, I did not, in fact, manage to get my nice full magic gauge because he hit me like, a, like an asshole, you know? I don't know if I can knock those back. I haven't had the opportunity to find out. So as you might have guessed, you can't step on those glowing words or you will get hurt. <sighs> when I was playing through this casually, these things were the easiest things in the world to fight. Now I find them weirdly difficult. I tend to fuck up when I'm fighting them and I don't know why. What changed? Anyway, uh, this is a bit of backtracking that's more forgivable than most because it's fairly likely that during the fight your camera will turn around and you'll notice that a uh, Alfine portal has appeared at the bottom. So... Um, yeah, I want to talk about Bayonetta's visual design again, but I'll have to wait until after this Alfheim portal. Because I was talking about that last episode, and I think it's worth picking back up again on, because I only kind of introduced it. Anyway, time to hand off. Uh, yep, thanks. Past me? It's past me, right? Yeah. So, this challenge is the next one of the sequence of challenges where the objective is to stay in the air for as long as possible, but by this point we actually have the Kashaldra Whip, which makes it incredibly easy. It has this uh, really simple basic attack where if you just hold the Y button, it whips out, grabs a hold of something and draws it close to you. Which means that you can pretty much infinitely maintain height provided there's infinite targets, which there are in this challenge, or at least there seem to be. You might notice at this point that the uh, the Alfheim looks a lot like our brief visit to Paradiso, and at this point in my casual playthrough I realised that and started to suspect that Alfheim was in fact some kind of primordial component of Paradiso, perhaps some kind of part of Paradiso where the natural world reigns supreme. And we're going to find out later on that I am in fact correct that this is part of Paradiso, it's not just some random other thing, but it's still curious as to why it's called Alfheim which is, you know, drawing in Norse mythology rather than the, you know, Christian stuff that it's been based on up until this point. Anyway, you can climb high enough that the uh, entire background starts to change colour, but that's all from me for now. Bye! So a solid first try there. 
It's a shame they don't let you, you know, slam down and hit the ground, because it would be interesting to see how long it takes from that kind of height. But yeah, so I wanted to talk about Bayonetta's visual design again. So her major influences are, again, runway fashion and traditional fashion illustration. There is also... Oh, hang on, did I equip? I should show you... Oh, no, I don't think we have it yet, do we? Yes, we do. Aha! So, the Umbra and Elegances are bonus costume elements, each of which only appears when you're using their respective weapons. As you can see, this one adds thigh-high... Uh, very high boots and a bit of a cat-like mask on her glasses. That's because um, the whip is themed around the dominatrix, so they give you dominatrix boots and a kind of a sexy cat mask. Because there's, you know, the sexy cat lady vibe is, a, is absolutely a thing that exists. But uh, I'm still going to be using Kusheldra most of the time. Nope, I'm going to be using Sharaba. Kusheldra is the whip that I switched away from. So, yeah, the, the major influences are... The fashion runway model aesthetic, well, not the model aesthetic, the um, the illustration style. Uh, drag queen, you know, hyper feminine accession. And uh, can I get on here? Yep. And the dominatrix. So the dominatrix influence is pretty clear in that it, you know, ties to her, you know, She's kind of a sadistic character, inherently, because of how she behaves. Also notice this animation is misaligned, it's quite funny. Um, she's she's kind of inherently sadistic. She enjoys hurting people, in general. Um, or at least hurting angels, which aren't people, but she really enjoys hurting them. So again, it's always worth smashing things, because some of them have bullets, and the ones that have bullets always have bullets. But yeah, so... Um, and, but it also plays to her untouchable femininity, her kind of absolute unflappableness. She is always in control. She always has all of the power in any situation. Um, and honestly, that's quite powerful and I like it. I missed. I hit the wrong one. Oh well. So the influences there are very obvious. Um, the influences in terms of camp are really more just in terms of the overall campness of the thing itself. And I think that a lot of the kind of ways it's implemented in this game sort of bespeak a, a sort of fundamental heterosexism of the people who made it. It's very much camp done by straight people, which is weird when you think about it. It's almost redeveloping camp from first principles by straight people rather than, you know, um, as queer people might draw on their own history already. But yeah, so... Let me just... there we go. There's also a nice little uh, flourish on the animation for this thing. All of these doors, as you can see, they dynamically move out of the way as you move through them, which is just really nice. It's a smooth little um, little thing. So I'm going to dive into the next Alfheim portal, and then after that hopefully I'll ramble a bit more about character design. It's down here somewhere. There it is. Um, but yeah, um... It's weird how kind of heterosexual and gender normative a lot of aspects of the of kind of this game and especially some of the humor in this game are considering how incredibly camp it is and how strongly associated camp as a concept is with queer identity. Oh my god, okay, right. Handing off. Ah. So yeah, uh the main difficulty of this one is as I think I mentioned before on the one I could not beat uh, a couple levels ago. If you only have a limited number of kicks and punches, it's really hard to do enough damage with enough combos to actually, you know, kill your opponents. It's viable on this one because we have the um, Shiraba Sword, which has this really strong uh, charge up move, and it does enough damage that if you manage to hit both of them with it consistently, you can actually kill them both with the big AoE of the spin, spin slash. And if you manage to do that, then... Uh, you spread the damage around enough that they're both beaten, and because there's only these two, you can generally make it through with just using the punches, obviously. In a moment, I'll hand back to Past Me, and Past Me will insist that I first tried this, but that's not true! I did, in fact, uh, fail my first attempt a couple of seconds in, and I forgot that it was uh, that there was a very short abortive first try. So, it's not- I didn't do one try this, I two tried this. Stop lying, Past Me. 
So, as you will have just seen, I managed to first try one of these limited kicks and punches. It's uh, kind of infuriating. I've no idea how you're supposed to get perfect platinum on the combo for these ones, considering that it's basically, you know, if you do a combo, you use up all your punches and kicks, and you won't kill them. So, the main trick there, I'm just going to use a healing item because there's some uh, difficult platformy bits here, and if I screw up, I don't want to get, you know, um, a big ol' failure on my, um, you know, on my report card at the end of the uh, semester, by which I mean chapter. So these things are pretty hard to dodge, because they kind of fill the screen, and when you're trying to jump over them, there are bushes in the way, which is very unfair, frankly. But yeah, I'm just going to come over here, grab an Antonio's ledger. Now, I think there's something I've missed on this level, but I'm not actually sure what it is, so we'll find out eventually, I suspect. Which graves within the city? Vigrid is littered with the legacies of an ancient age. Amongst these are the stone coffins used to bury departed witches. Along with their fellow overseers of history, the Lumen Sages, the Umbra witches use their incredible powers to repel any intrusion upon Vigrid. Under these auspices, the witches abode by the terms of their netherworldly contracts, and upon parting with the physical world, the strongest of the witches were deified as guardians and buried in stone coffins throughout the town. These stone coffins were sealed tight, and it was said that only those with the knowledge of witches' magic could open them. Even during the witch hunts, when the coffins were subjected to attempted demol demolition, not a single soul was able to peer into the contents within. According to one theory, the contract with their demon master stipulates that upon leaving this earth, a witch's soul nor body can remain. It is said Umbran burial customs were developed for that very reason. The women would bury their loved ones in treasured stone coffins to lessen the pain of those destined for inferno, even if the effect was slight. Today, unable to break the magic seal upon the coffins, the Lumen Sage Seal of the Sun has been placed upon the stone sarcophagi as a counterweight. If, by chance, the power of the witches were to return to this world, they would be prevented from opening their coffins due to the seal. This is a clear indicator of the sort of persecution these women were subjected to during the witch hunts. While the whereabouts of the witches' tombs is outlined above, the location of the tombs for the Lumen Sages remains unknown. According to remaining records, they had taken up final resting places within, with the Umbra in the secluded region known as the Crescent and Sunrise Valleys. It is said the Lumen Sages, who conducted their duties not in the darkness but in the light, rest peacefully in their valley after departing this world. Finally, there are rumours that somewhere in Vigrid, research is underway to extract the spirit energy of these departed witches. It seems that the fate of the Umbra Witch and Lumen Sage has yet to be truly decided. So yeah, it's curious um, how much historicity is actually the case here, because were they perhaps... Can I get this open with one, one of these? Yeah. Right. So that's the latest one of these. I haven't remembered to mention previously, but if you look closely, you'll see that the weapon that each disc unlocks is inscribed upon it. So the Sonata in DK448 here, as you can see, will grant um, two gauntlet-based weapons, which are basically identical to the weapons you get when you successfully kill a... Um, what are they even called? The two... Uh, the two angels that are, or you always fight in pairs. Faith and... Mercy? Something like that. The, I want the ones I keep saying I hate fighting. So this is of course the next enemy we're going to fight. It looks like it's going to be a boss, but really it's just a big tough mini boss. Much like the um, Beloveds that we fought previously. As always, there's a ton of little flourishes. Also, yeah, um, the frame generally avoids being kind of male gazy for the most part, possibly due to the way that kind of Bayonetta's sexualization is tied to her identity and her character and honestly also to, you know, her power as an individual. I don't mean in terms of magical powers, I mean in terms of, um, you know, her unflappable confidence, all of that sort of stuff. Um, I actually hate fighting these guys, I think they're kind of boring. Their um, melee attacks are very quick and therefore quite hard to dodge because there's not really much of a lead-in time to them and periodically they just fly away, which is irritating for obvious reasons. Also, their fireballs are faster. So yeah, if you go in and try to get a melee combo on them, they tend to um, just instantly counter-attack with one of their really quick melee attacks, which are, you know, difficult to actually hit. I think this is the first time you start to get counter-attack um, 
you know, torture finishes like this, which don't actually beat it. The only previous time, I think, is the uh, boss we fought previously. In the previous mission, I guess. So, that should be... Oh, no. Hmm, okay. I guess I didn't land the end of the combo. Anyway, so her sexualization is constant, but usually it's um, for a thematic purpose. But occasionally you do just get lingering shots that are um, somewhat gratuitous and less, you know, thematically meaningful. You know, they speak less to her character. Also note that uh, we killed the snake, so naturally it's the big bird who gets to eat him. Agramon, I think his name was. I assume she shouts their names. But yeah, so I was talking about, um, yeah, her design as a character. I was talking about camp, I was talking about uh, fashion design, and I was talking about one other thing, which was the uh, sexualization thing. So, so yeah, the way the sexualization is tied into who she is as a person and how it kind of grants her power in almost every kind of situation. It reinforces her unflappableness, her untouchableness, her absolute mastery over everything. Um, you know, because she's a mistress. So I'm just going to smash all of these first, because every time we go anywhere all of these things respawn, so I might as well see what I can grab. And then let's take a look in the gates of hell. Are we going to get a new quote, perhaps? Another LP? <laughs> Working me to the bow. But no need to pity me. I was bored anyways. Let me go whip some things into shape for you. I forgot that we had a new weapon for him, so of course there wouldn't be a new quote. Now, I'm pretty sure I recognise this piece of music, so I suspect these are all extant pieces of classical music rather than, you know, new compositions just for this game. I do love the design in the bar. Here we go, how was your holiday? Took a bit to pound into shape, but the workmanship's solid. Now, go put this thing to good use. So as you can see, that's, you know, very much an elemental weapon. Um, I think I mentioned before that the only thing these alt versions do is allow you to put them on both your hands and your feet at the same time. Essentially, it's a second copy of the weapon. Um, but that's really all there is to them. So... Yeah, that means there should be another treasure unlocked. I think there's one of these for each uh, weapon in the game. But, uh, wow, it really eats into your money, huh? I'm just buying all the cosmetics to show them off, but maybe I should be buying the, um, you know, actually useful things instead. Anyway, that's all from him for now. So, yeah, um... Generally speaking, the frame doesn't actually oogle her. Like, it's very clear that the, you know, camera direction isn't oogling her unless a character is. In which case we could be argued to be, you know, seeing from the point of view of that character. Uh, oh, Rodan and the Gates of Hell. There is a place beloved by wanted men and rogues where money and power rule all. It is where I have established my office. Those who call this place by its given name are instantly identified as newcomers, as the tired hands of this rat hole all call it by a single name, the Dump. Bloody battles and dirty disputes over money are an everyday occurrence here, and the concept of concern for one's fellow man was long, long since lost on the Dump's denizens. What the people here are after, what they love to see, is not of this world. They thirst for the uproar that only the occult can inspire. The appearance of a spectre, a man being devoured by a demon, these are the snacks they eat as they drink and cavort in the dump's numerous watering holes. It is this place that I have come on my pilgrimage in search of a grasp on reality. The dump is a wretched hive for all sorts of scum and villainy, home to everyone from black market businessmen to informants to devil hunters in between. But amongst them all, one man is particularly strange. His name is Rodin, proprietor of the Gates of Hell Bar. His front may be that of a bartender, but rumour has it it is actually an arms dealer. Of course, if such a man as myself was to visit his establishment, there is no way all of his secrets would be laid bare. However, I can tell just by the air around him that he is a dangerous man. Unlike the standard assortment of thugs in this place, his is a sort of danger on a truly different level. According to my colleagues, if one carries enough clout here, Rodin is known to provide a gun or a blade should the fee prove satisfactory. That is all I have been able to wring out of the people here. 
There are also rumours that if you enter the bar from some sort of hidden entrance, he will provide you things that money cannot buy. Or, so saith the gossips in this occult-obsessed town. They even go so far as to say that these things are not made by mortal means, but are weapons made from materials available only in Inferno. In the dump, there are enough rumours to rot one's ears, and if I hadn't seen the fresco of Trinity of Realities, a staple of the Vigridian religions, on Rodin's wall, I think I would have dismissed the talk of him as nothing more than tall tales. In any case, I am able to fully investigate this man's secrets, and I will surely be able to obtain the truth I so desperately seek. However, aimless sniffing around in this town is a great way to wind up dead. I'll have to be prudent, and not leave things to chance. So that sort of answers some questions, but it also sort of asks more questions, because I find myself wondering... Is the whole kind of... Well, first off, is that... <laughs> Or was it the heap, actually? Hmm, maybe, I can't remember. Oh well, I'm not going to check it out now, I can't be bothered. So, yeah, I find myself wondering if um, Vigrid is close to heaven and whole, the hole, the heap, is close to hell, does that mean that Rodan's bar isn't in the city we saw at the beginning, which looked very much like New York? Because, you know, if Barcelona is close to heaven. I can completely accept that New, that New York is close to hell. However, um, Rodin himself said uh, ages and ages and ages ago that uh, the city in which he and Bayonetta both live is close to both heaven and hell, which again, I would buy of New York. So, uh, okay. Yeah, I just, I hate fighting these things. This one's, I think, actually an optional fight. There are several optional fights in the game where you can just run past them and move on. And as far as I know, this is one of them. But uh, instead of running over there and smashing down the gate, I'm going to beat him. Because beating him unlocks uh, a bonus fight back inside the tower, which, with any luck, will let me show off the thing I've been trying to show off for ages. So I'll just drop down here. Bit off centre, but oh well. Right, so I'm actually going to use another healing item on the grounds that I might as well, and also there's some tough stuff coming up. So, yeah, uh, occasionally there are bonus verses that you only get if you happen to... I swear to god she says Humphrey when she summons this chainsaw. So, yeah, um... Notice that this chainsaw is the first weapon we've seen that is not, you know, heavenly. Um, it's the first thing we've got from the torture attack that is not heavenly or wielded by the thing we're fighting. It's very clearly, you know, hellish. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, what, what, what weapon would heaven... What weapon would hell use as opposed to heaven? Although, I guess Doomguy uses a chainsaw and he's very much neither of heaven nor hell. He just hates them both. So, yep, I do hate fighting these things. That was a solid, uh, a solid score on this one, though. But yeah, so as reliant as the game is on backtracking, it does have these bonus um, combats that are not challenge rooms like the Alfheims, but which, unless you backtrack at the right time, you will completely miss. I'm always secretly hoping when I smash stuff that it will drop the instant healing items. Because it's so useful that they don't um, count, you know, for your uh, item usages. So, now there was a bullet in there when I smashed it earlier. And there was a bullet earlier in this level as well, which means that sometimes there are multiple bullet-granting smashable objects in one level. Which was a question I had earlier, whether or not that was the case. But time to run off to go, you know, oh, can I not? Yeah, you can just smash this fence down. So... Uh, when you're fighting the second one of those snake guys, if you do just smash it down and run on, you can just head out here and trigger the cutscene and you don't actually need to fight him. But that does uh, count as a skipped combat on your um, on your assessment at the end of the level. So if you want a good score, you need to not do that. I don't know if there's a difference in your score between, you know, getting stone level for something, you know, doing really badly and uh, actually succeeding to do it, but uh, sorry, actually not succeeding to do it at all by skipping it. I imagine that it would just count as a zero on every score and therefore heavily penalise you, but I don't actually know.
I suppose coming here has given you a second wind. Feeling better, Bayonetta? Who are you? And don't you dare say my long lost sister. She's clearly your wife. Sister, you've quite the active imagination. You and I once fought for the jewel upon the crown of the Umbra throne. And now that you've returned, my sleeping beauty, it is time to finish that fight. for daydreaming. I love these excessively stylized fight scenes where they're basically just competitively voguing with one another simultaneously. It has all the kind of um, relentless joy of a, uh, of a child slamming their action figures together. And all of the same impact. Like, it's absolutely ridiculous, it's completely absurd, and yet somehow completely in character and in keeping with everything that's happening. Is it fighting time yet? Can I do something? So I mentioned before that Jean's, um, you know, sort of totemic animal, for lack of a better term, is the moth, her, like, uh, recurring animal motif. And that's even, you know, once you, when you actually see her more clearly here in this fight, that's even more obvious because, um, you know, she has that puffy, that puffy ruff around her neck, which, you know, many uh, of the fluffier moth species do. She has her moth earrings, obviously, as you may or may not have noticed. And um, the long, you know, um, what are they even called? Crests? It would be a crest on a helmet, but it's not on a helmet. Um, but yeah, the long tails on her guns are very much also um, very much similar to moth antenna, although they're very visibly... Uh, bird feathers but you know it's all designed to kind of evoke a certain kind of feeling and that feeling is mothy rather than birdy in my opinion so she also much like the uh, twin enemies I've been fighting this whole you know uh, this whole time much to my fury oh boy so when I was doing this when I was doing my practice run earlier I basically screwed up every fight except this one and did this one perfectly I did not do great on this one this time. Mind you, the fact that I keep getting... Oh, hang on. What's the matter, sweetie? Afraid of something, are you? Afraid? Me? This is a waste of my time. You're still not ready. See, moths, I told you. So, oh, I've forgotten what I was talking about. 
Oh yeah, I was saying that the fact that I seem to always get a uh, a low score for damage, as in damage taken, and a high score for um, both combo and time probably means that I should be playing more defensively in general. But uh, who cares? Oh my, that was bloody amazing! Oh my, I hope that doesn't awaken anything in me. But it's fine. There's nothing wrong with being a furry. And that is the end of chapter 5. Let's see how well I did. Uh, a silver. It's not great. I probably would have been a gold if I hadn't had to use two healing items. Um, I'd ideally like to hit gold on all of these, but there's not much I can do. Also, I was going to say this earlier and I forgot, but... Um, and by earlier I mean last episode. Luca's gloves weird me out. They don't, they're, I, are they supposed to look like fashionable, you know, fashionable upper arm length gloves, you know, because they don't. They look like something from a hazmat suit, but like a baroque hazmat suit. Let's see how many I can get. Oh boy. So, I don't know if it's just inaccurate or if I'm just bad at this, but I never seem to hit the, the bonus ones anymore. Oh dear, oh dear. Um, but yeah, so that's basically all I have to say for now, really. So I might as well just finish this up. 65, I'll take. Uh, 70 is kind of my baseline for having done well, but let's grab one of these, just restock a little bit, and switch the rest over to Halos. So getting another look at this lovely map, notice that the statues have been knocked over. I love the way the map changes between different uh, different chapters. Mind you, you might notice it says Enlightenment Commercial District. That implies that we will be going to some kind of commercial district next chapter. We will, in fact, not be doing that. So that's going to be all from me for today. Thank you for joining me on this bizarre journey. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and there's links to my other projects in the description. Thank you so much for watching.